Welcome back, geology fans. Before we leave our second site, we need to investigate the formation in the valley, east of the Lycans Formation. Ralston Creek is below us and runs through this easily eroded shale unit, which coincidentally enough is called the Ralston Creek Shale. We note this on our chart as 2C, Ralston Creek Shale, with disconformities at its bottom and top contacts. The lichens was partially erased by erosion before being submerged in a marine setting for the Ralston Shale to deposit. That's how we get the disconformity. In fact, this disconformity jumps us from the 260 million year old lichens formation to the Ralston, which is 160 million years old. Though not as impressive as the 1.4 billion year Great Unconformity, this 100 million year gap should be noted as it takes us united with the supercontinent Pangaea to a more independent Laurasia. The main minerals for the Ralston Shale are clay, which is really a size term, but we're going to use this term to represent the complex group of minerals that exist as clay. Uh, there is also calcite present here, as some sections of the unit are limestone. Grain size for a shale or mudstone we just mark as clay, as with the minerals. And the age is 160 million years ago. The environment is offshore marine and the event is transgression of a sea onto land which is being driven by an enhanced greenhouse effect that will continue for the next 100 million years. We get back on the bus and cross over the Jurassic Shale to enter Dinosaur Ridge. The disconformity at the top of the Ralston Creek Formation jumps us into the Jurassic Morrison Formation. The base of this slope is about 155 million years old which is when we see the first dinosaurs turning to birds in the fossil record. So now our coniferous gymnosperms are joined by the much-loved avian dinosaurs. We get off the bus at the first metal structure to begin our investigation of Site 3, the Dakota Hogback. We saw from a distance that the lower half of this slope did not support tree growth, but the upper half did. We are in that lower Morrison formation, which shows layers of more resistant rocks that are not laterally uniform nor continuous. The layers of resistant material changes in thicknesses and pinches out at its ends and is surrounded by this more easily eroded material. We see both areas of red and green, which makes us suspect both oxidized and reduced environments of deposition might be encountered. Okay, now it's time to get up close and personal again with this rock. As with all formations observed so far, we are still tilting to the east, and it won't take long to figure out that the resistant rock we saw is a sandstone, and the less resistant material is mudstone. We also note the presence of large dinosaur bones, which have come from sauropod dinosaurs like these. What kind of environment puts down inconsistent sand layers with interbedded mud and incorporating terrestrial fossils? That's right, it's our old friend, the fluvial environment. Remember that fluvial means stream systems. To put this environment into its context, a lot of time has passed since we were hanging out on Pangaea and the sea from the north has receded some to give a broad sloping plain being drained from the east with an extensive set of stream and lake systems. The fluvial and lacustrine deposits of the Morrison Formation extend from the Texas Panhandle through Oklahoma, covering Colorado and Wyoming, getting into Utah, Idaho, Nebraska, the Dakotas, and Montana, and even up into Canada. Being the midpoint in the age of reptiles, the land-based Morrison Formation is synonymous with dinosaurs. In fact, it was in 1877 that Colorado School of Mines' very own Arthur Lakes found the first dinosaur bones around this location, like the sauropods and the state dinosaur, the stegosaur. Arthur Lakes sent news to the more civilized East Coast, being sure to get news to both Edward Drinker Cope at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia and Othniel Charles Marsh of the Peabody Museum at Yale. The two Eastern paleontologists had met in Berlin in 1864 and had liked each other enough to start naming species after each other, 
but their personalities had by this time led to a rivalry that was getting less and less friendly each year. Arthur Lake sent a letter to Marsh and got no response, and so he sent some bones as well. Since he hadn't heard back from Marsh, Lake took the added precaution and sent a sample to Cope as well. Once Marsh really looked at the stuff and knew what he had, he secured Lakes' services and asked him to keep it all a secret. And Lake said, well, that was too late. He already had told Cope. So Marsh got out there as quickly as possible, but was shortly joined by Cope. The problem they found at the five quarry sites on this ridge was that getting the bones out of the Morrison Formation is really difficult because the sandstone is too tightly cemented here. Not only is it too tight to let the bones go easily, it's too tight to allow root penetration easily, which helps solve the mystery of our tree line. But both Cope and Marsh heard news that this formation, the Morrison Formation, extended far out in places like northern Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah, and the two mined the Morrison Formation, named after our location here on the outskirts of the town of Morrison. In the history books, this is known as the Bone Wars. The rush to excavate and publish caused the two to make many mistakes and mix and match dinosaurs whose names had to be scrapped, and the beloved brontosaurus I grew up with is apparently now a patasaurus. As we drifted with Laurasia further from Gondwana land, the Felsic volcanoes were going off to our north that had high uranium content. This enriched ash fell in the Morrison Formation, and uranium being lithophobic, meaning the element does not like to be in the solid state as much as in solution, was quickly taken up by oxidized water as uroxyl. But if this uranium groundwater hits a chemically reducing environment, especially one with lots of pore cavities that can act as material traps, such as a dinosaur bone or a gymnosperm log, then the uroxyl turns into the mineral carnitite, which precipitates inside the fossils of the Morrison Formation. A Geiger counter will measure about two to three times the background radiation when placed against the bones of the Morrison, but this is mostly alpha particles, two protons, two neutrons, that get blocked by air, so the radiation drops off quickly away from the bone. Just don't sit on the bones when naked or eat them, and they're harmless, even though you might not be. Ash layers at this location indicate an approximate age of 150 million years. As we walk up the Morrison section, we encounter a different unit in which a more easily eroded material showing alternating reds and greens are exposed. The rill erosion on its surface suggests a mudstone, and upon close examination we find it is indeed a mudstone. And not a shale either, as shale technically has the structure of fizzle layers. This material doesn't. The reds suggest oxidized ferric iron, and the greens suggest reduced ferrous iron. The classic environment that will make both oxidized and reduced mudstone is soil. An ancient soil is called a paleosol, which is what this unit in the Morrison represents. To get a soil profile, the area must be neither in E world nor in D world, but a neutral, stable surface exposed to the elements. So, as we examine this whole section of Morrison, we see river systems depositing sand and mud, and even lake systems depositing clay and silt, and then stable surfaces that produce soil, and then return to these streams and lakes again. At the next metal structure, we stop again to examine large depressions in the rock which go with the sauropod bones we saw below. These are the footprints of those great beasts, and by following the depressed layers, we see that it was not a single animal at that time. These were herds of animals migrating through this area over many generations. Just as the herds of mammalian herbivores move across the plains of Africa with their attendant predators and scavengers, so here we have such an ecosystem, but with dinosaurs. New research shows these animals to have different metabolism than cold-blooded reptiles. Some show warm-blooded traits, and these sauropods went for a whole new technique of gigantothermy. As we reach the top of the hill, we are starting to hit the tree line, and so we look back on the Morrison Formation and fill out our chart for 3A, saying the minerals are clays and quartz. 
The grain size is all under one millimeter, showing a lower energy of environment of deposition. We'll give this area a general date of 150 million years, though the Morrison does range from 156 to 147 million years ago. Our tree line can thus be a timeline as well, as everything below it and to the immediate west is older than 147 million years ago, and everything above it and to the immediate east is younger than 147 million years ago. The Jurassic ends and the Cretaceous begins at 145 million years ago, so it must be just above the tree line. The environment for the Morrison Formation, 3A, is fluvial, with strong evidence for dinosaurs. The few plant fossils from this formation show a vegetated tropical rainforest of gymnosperms dominated by conifers. The event is a regression of the sea that had once been here, but contemporaneous rocks show the seas are beginning to rise again.